Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise, and this is Tend to Life, your one stop, true crime stop. That I said stop twice, but guys, I need to like figure out a new tagline. I am just so over saying the same thing every time. Anyways, this is the channel where we're talking so much true crime. And today, I hope you are ready to hang with me for a while because boy, do we have a big case to talk about. One that is like massive, super confusing. And I mean, we, we just got a lot to talk about guys. So I hope you're like going to get comfy. I'm going to get comfy here. And I hope you are just like ready to hang with me for a while. So when I first heard about this case and it is the Alex Murdoch case, heard about it like about a year ago or whenever it was, as things were like beginning to unravel, I could not keep things straight. It was like there was something in the news every other day. People were asking me about this case. They were asking me to cover it. I was like, to be honest, I can't even keep my head on my body right now because it's spinning so fast because there is just so much happening. So I finally now have been able to get a full comprehensive overview with the details of what has gone on in this case. And holy shit, guys. Oh my God. Like, that's why we're going to be here so long because this case is just so complex. And this person is just so downright dirty, nasty, greedy. It's like a wave of crime has just been like following this person. And like, I shouldn't say a wave of crime, like a wave of criminal activity. It is bizarre. So if you're like me and you've been tuning into the case, but you're not quite sure all the details or you really do have no clue what's real or I said that weird. Or if you really have no clue what really happened in this case, but you've heard the name, because I'm sure you have all heard the name, watch this video because I'm breaking it down for you start to finish. So let's jump right in. Tend to life with Annie Elise starts right now. Today's case is a massive case. It has been going on for a while now, and it includes corruption, lies, greed, evil, financial crimes, and reopened cases, and even murder. So we are going to get right into the case of Alex Murdoch and go over everything that we know that led up to his arrest. Alex Murdoch is a 54-year-old disbarred attorney from Hampton County, South Carolina. Before being disbarred, he was an extremely successful and high-profile attorney in South Carolina. His family has a long, long history of being a very prominent family in Hampton County. The Murdochs own a law firm that is over 100 years old and were also in charge of the county prosecutor's office for many decades, spanning three generations. Quite frankly, they're a family that nobody would want to mess with. Alex's great-grandfather, his grandfather, and his father all ran the prosecutor's office at one point or another. And before being disbarred, Alex was a volunteer prosecutor, essentially making him the fourth generation. When he wasn't working, he was being a dad to two sons, Buster and Paul, and a husband to his wife, Maggie. From the outside, the family seemed to have it all. Money, cars, careers, properties, and more. But behind closed doors, there was deep-rooted issues that would all come to a head when Maggie, Alex's wife, and Paul, Alex's son, were killed on June 17, 2021. Everything that had been going on behind closed doors or that was hushed to the public was no longer hushed or secretive. We're going to go through the timeline, but we are going to be jumping back and forth quite a bit to really understand everything going on in this family and the deaths that have been looming around them for years. Taking it back first to 2015, that's where we're going to start. On July 8th, 2015, a man named Stephen Smith was found dead at the age of 19. Stephen happened to be gay, and his mother is convinced that his death was a hate crime. Someone saw Stephen and called 911. Port says the victim was found in the middle of Sandy Run Road, deceased from some sort of blunt force trauma to the head. Responded to the scene, I saw no vehicle debris, skid marks, or injuries consistent with someone being struck by a vehicle. Some officers even say that Stephen looked like he had been shot by his eye. During the initial investigation, there were tips about Buster Murdoch being involved in this. There were also tips about a possible relationship between Buster and Stephen. But eventually, Stephen's murder was determined to be a hit and run against all of the other reports and information about 
seeing that it looked like he had maybe been shot and that there was no skid marks, no debris, it still was determined to be a hit and run. And Buster should have been interviewed when the tips came in, but he wasn't. And if he did have anything to do with this, could his family's wealth and status in the community, specifically law enforcement, be the reason that he wasn't seriously looked into or questioned? The next death, close to the Murdoch family, happened in February of 2018. The housekeeper and nanny who worked for the Murdochs for over 20 years died at their house. Her name was Gloria Satterfield, and she was 57 years old, and on February 2nd, she had allegedly tripped and fallen, and this was down the stairs at the Murdoch home. Seems very reminiscent of the staircase murders, am I right? So Maggie and Paul were the only ones home at the time. Maggie called 911. 9.24 a.m. 38 2nd, February 2, 2018. Uh, 4147 Moselle Road. Hey, can you give me the address one more time? Make sure I got it right. Yes, 4147 Moselle Road. Okay, what's going on out there? I'm sorry? What's going on out there? Uh, my housekeeper has fallen and her head is bleeding. I cannot get her up. Okay, you said she's fallen. She's bleeding from the head? Yes. How old is she? I'm not sure, like 58 maybe. Do you know if she fell from standing or not? No. No. Where'd she fall from? Uh, from the, she fell going up the steps, up the brick steps. Okay, so is she outside or inside? Outside. Okay. How many steps is there? Uh, eight. Okay, is she on the ground or is she up near the top? She's on the ground. She's on the ground. She's on the ground. Is she conscious? Uh, no, not really. Is she awake at all? Yes. Okay. Is she just not, like, responding appropriately, but she is awake? <laughs> Man, she's not, no, she's not responding. Okay, I just, I, I've already got them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down, ma'am. Knowing if she's conscious is one of the things that the medic needs to know if she's responding really. at all to you. No. Okay, so she's not responsive at all. Well, I mean, she's mumbling. Okay, so she is somewhat conscious. Um, is she breathing okay? Yes. Is she bleeding from anywhere? Yes, her head. Okay, are you guys able to control the bleeding? No. Can you I put a even clean tried. rag or anything on it? Uh, yeah, I got it. Okay, is she bleeding from, me. like, her face, the back of the head? I've got an neck. ambulance coming. Sir, my name what? Where exactly is she bleeding from on her head? I'm not sure, at the top of her head. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, gosh. What happened? She she just fell back down. Can I get off this phone so I can go down there? Can I have your name and phone number? Or are you able to Maggie. bring the phone down by her? What? Or are you on a cell phone where you can walk down there I'm and on talk? A cell phone. No. Okay, can you bring it with you so we can ask her some questions about what kind of pain she's having? Hello? Yeah, can, can you ask the patient what kind of pain she's having? Ma'am, she can't talk. Okay, do you know... She's cracked her head and there's blood on the concrete and she bleeds out of her left ear. Okay, she's bleeding out of her ear? And out of her head. She's cracked her skull. Okay. All right, the other lady said that she had tried to stand up and fell down again? No, she. I was holding her up. And okay. She told me to turn her loose and she was trying to use her arm, but then she fell back over. Okay, do you guys know who she is? Yes, yeah, she works for us. Okay, do you know if she's ever had a stroke or anything before? Ma'am, can you stop asking her this question? I already, have them the on the way. I already have them on the way. Me asking questions does not slow them down in any way. These are relevant questions that I have to ask for the ambulance. One of my questions is, has she ever had a stroke? I don't believe she's ever had a stroke, not that I know Okay. That. 
Okay, is she able to talk to you guys at all, or is she unconscious now? She's not unconscious, she's just mumbling. Okay. I believe she's maybe hit her head and had, maybe has a concussion or something. Okay. Maybe. Do you know what her name is? Gloria Satterfield. You said Sanderfield? Ma'am? You said Sanderfield? Satterfield. Satterfield. Okay, what's the house look like out there? It's, it's a, um, it's offset off the road. Okay. It's a big house, got a long driveway. With a long um, driveway? Yeah, um... Is there a gate or anything down there that they're going to need to come through? There's, there's two big, big brick columns that have to come through. Okay, but there's no, like, gate code or anything that they need? No, ma'am. And tell okay. them that they can look for a fellow on a 6x6 six six Ranger. Okay. Waiting on them in the road is green. You know what the... They probably know what the Ranger looks like. Yeah. You said, like, Fellas green... Got on a black, got on a black sweater, okay. a hat and pants. Okay. All right. All right. Um, if, if something changes with her, if she loses consciousness or anything like that, I need one of you guys to call me back right away, okay? Okay, well, how about, how long is it going to take? Cause this took that I don't know. Back I, back I've had them on the way since, since Maggie first called me. They were toned right away. Okay. All right, but they're, I think they're coming. Oh, hang on one minute. Let me check. They're coming from somewhere on Belt Highway in Ruffin, okay? That's where their station is. Thank you. All right, but like I said, if something changes, call me back. Yes, sir. Okay. In the call, both Maggie and Paul seemed very bothered to answer questions. However, they also seemed extremely calm for such a big incident happening, especially given that she had worked for this family for over 20 years, I would have expected more panic in their voices. After 20 years of working on a personal level, people usually are like family. So your reaction, in my opinion, usually would be a little bit different here. So even though Alex claimed he was working 25 minutes away from the house, he somehow was able to get to the house before the paramedics got there. In that time frame that he was there, he had said that Gloria actually told him that she had tripped over the dogs, but no one else heard Gloria say that. She ended up passing away on February 26th in the hospital. Gloria had two sons, Tony and Brian, who were now left without a mom. Two sons that were questioning how their mom, a healthy 57-year-old, died from a short fall down the stairs. Nonetheless, they trusted the Murdochs. After all, they had known them for a huge portion of their lives. Alex made a promise to look after them financially and make sure that their lives were, you know, perfect and still intact and that he would help out as much as possible. He talked the boys into hiring Corey Fleming as their attorney and instructed them to file a wrongful death lawsuit with the intention of his insurance paying them out. The boys had no clue that Corey was actually one of Alex's longtime best friends and was even his college roommate. Corey Fleming then had the boys hire Chad Westendorf. Chad's job was to be the financial representative on behalf of Tony and Brian, the two boys. But Tony and Brian were never told that they legally had rights to be their own representatives, nor were they ever told that both Corey and Alex had a professional work history with Chad. So Alex, Corey, and Chad all agreed on the suit, and Corey and Chad filed the wrongful death suit with Alex saying that one of his insurance companies, Lloyd's of London, would pay the boys out. Now, before a lawsuit settles, an attorney for the filing party is supposed to always check with their clients to make sure that they agree with the settlement details. However, Corey did not do that, nor did he even tell the boys about the settlement of $500,000. So when he got that check on January 7th, 2019, instead of calling Tony and Brian to let them know that there was money for them and that settlement had been reached, he wrote a check for 403000 of that settlement to Alex Murdoch, DBA Forge. DBA means doing business as, just as a heads up here. So Forge was a consulting firm that worked closely with Alex's office. He made a Forge account in his name to try and also go undetected. So instead of Gloria's sons receiving that money, Alex was now the receiver of it, and they had no idea. But 
The $400,000 and some change wasn't enough for Greedy Alex. For two years, Chad and Corey continued to get payouts from Lloyds of London and Nautilus, which was Alex's other insurance company. The final number paid out was over $4.3 million. None of the payout documents were filed in court, and the Satterfield boys were never made aware of these settlement amounts. Alex had walked away with over $3.5 million himself from this settlement. Kind of sounds like Erica Jane the housewife, that situation. Not saying she's guilty, not saying she's guilty, but sounds a lot like that situation with her husband. And not only was that completely illegal, but it was absolutely morally wrong and one of the grossest things that anybody can do to a grieving family. The only reason Tony and Brian ever found out about what was going on was because they saw things in the media, on the news, about this settlement. So we're going to come back to the rest of Gloria and the Satterfield boys and the Murdoch saga later. So remember what we've talked about as we shift now to the next death close to the Murdoch family. We're now on death number three. So on February 23rd, 2019, just before the year mark of Gloria's death, Paul decided to take out his family's boat, which was in Alex's name, and he wanted to take it out with some friends. Included on this boat trip was Mallory Beach and her boyfriend, Anthony. Mallory was just 19 years old and was the light of her family's life. She was described as being loved by everybody around her, a sweet girl who had just graduated high school a few months prior. Mallory, Anthony, Anthony's cousin Connor, and his girlfriend Miley, Paul and Morgan, and Morgan was Paul's girlfriend, were all planning to go to a house and an oyster party that night at Pocky Island. I hope I'm saying that right. Now, Pocky Island was a boating distance from the Murdoch Island, which was a river property that the Murdoch family owned. So because they were all going to the same party, they thought it would be fun to meet at Murdoch Island and just boat over. All six of them were underage, but they took a cooler on the boat with alcohol in it to just party, let loose, and hang out. And it's not out of the normal for college-age kids, even underage, to take alcohol on a boat trip. But you would think that they would be smart enough to have a designated driver that was not consuming alcohol. Paul, especially given that it was his family's boat, you would think would be that driver. But Paul was actually the only one who bought alcohol, as you can see on surveillance footage. He used his older brother Buster's ID to buy the alcohol. So around 7 p.m., they got in the boat and headed to that party. They stayed there till around midnight and then decided to get back onto the boat, onto the water. All six of them were together and Paul insisted on stopping at a bar in Beaufort called Luther's Rare and Well Done around 12.45 a.m. Only Paul and Connor went in, both of them using fake IDs. The other four waited outside. They had two rounds of shots, as seen on surveillance, before coming back outside to get back on the boat just after 1 a.m. Mallory was seen alive on surveillance for the last time. The boat took off around 1.15 a.m., and according to Miley's interview, some of the passengers on the boat started arguing with Paul because he was, of course, intoxicated, which made him drive erratically and start driving the boat in circles. Anthony actually asked, too, to be let off at a dock nearby, but Paul refused. He kept leaving the wheel to fight with his girlfriend Morgan about the entire situation just completely drunk, and this absolutely terrified poor Mallory, who was just wanting to get home safe. Unfortunately, that would never happen for her. Around 2.20 a.m., after the boat increased its speed, it crashed into the Archer's Creek Bridge. Mallory was ejected from the boat upon impact and nowhere to be found. Connor called 911 immediately and begged them to come and find Mallory. Anthony, Mallory's boyfriend, was obviously extremely upset by the whole situation, so when law enforcement arrived, an officer had him sit in his car and just kind of relax and take a beat. But when Anthony saw Paul smiling, he had reached the end of his ropes, and he actually tried charging at Paul. Everyone except for Anthony was taken to the hospital because he wanted to stay to find Mallory. There were some serious injuries, including a broken jaw for Connor and a really badly injured hand for Morgan, Paul's girlfriend. And you would think that if something like that happened, Paul would figure his shit out pretty quickly. But that wasn't the case here, which makes me wonder, was this like spoiled rich kid syndrome? Sounds like it to me. He was highly uncooperative at the hospital with staff and with police. They let him sober up for several hours, but his blood alcohol level was still 0.24 hours later. That is three times over the legal limit. 
That means he was incredibly drunk hours prior to when the accident even happened. Now, of course, Alex, Paul's dad, came to the rescue with his manipulative ways, his deep pockets, and his community ties. He went room to room at the hospital, visiting every passenger on that boat. In fact, a security guard heard him say, she's gone, don't worry, when he was talking on the phone with someone. Was he talking about Mallory? Was he saying don't worry to reassure that she wouldn't be able to tell the truth about what had happened? Regardless, the rest of the passengers were not about to cover up for Paul for anything, and this was the absolute final straw for his girlfriend Morgan as well. Mallory's body wasn't found for eight days. It was finally found on March 3rd, five miles from the crash site, and unfortunately, she was long gone when she was found. She would never have been able to tell her side of the story. But her family loved her too much to let her death be in vain. A month later, they had filed a wrongful death suit against the Murdochs, against the bar where they had stopped at, and that convenience store where Paul bought the alcohol. However, they eventually amended the lawsuit to only include Alex and Buster Murdoch, In a deposition from Morgan, she stated that the Murdochs all knew of Paul's alcohol issues. She said Paul was drinking to the point of being insanely drunk almost every day and that his parents and his brother knew about it. She also said that not only did they know about it, but his parents actually provided the credit card for him to buy the alcohol and would even buy it for him on some occasions. And his brother Buster knew he was using his ID to buy alcohol as well. Morgan also provided many photos and videos against her own once boyfriend showing the drinking activities that Paul was involved with, which made her deposition all the more credible. On April 18th, 2019, it was the day that Paul was officially charged relating to that boating incident. He was charged with three felony counts of boating under the influence, including causing the death of Mallory Beach and seriously injuring two other passengers. Paul pleaded not guilty and was bonded, of course, out of jail. While awaiting trial, he was keeping a pretty low profile and pretty much staying home consistently. But 2021 seemed to bring even more issues for the Murdoch family. According to some people close to the family, Maggie and Alex's marriage was now on the rocks. There wasn't any love there. Maggie was no longer coming by the office for lunch, and apparently she began looking into their financial state, which wasn't something she had previously done. Allegedly, Maggie saw a divorce lawyer, too, in Charleston in the beginning of May 2021. Alex was staying at the family's 1,700-acre home, which they called their hunting lodge, and Maggie was supposedly staying at their beach house on Edisto Island. Now, although a spokesperson for Alex disputes any claims about marital issues or strife, there definitely seems to be a sense of division, not only living separately at this point, but also Maggie's visit to the divorce attorney. On June 4th, 2021, there was a mediation meeting taking place for that wrongful death lawsuit. There was no resolution during mediation, which meant that they were all still going to be heading for trial, which is actually still pending to this day. A few days later, on June 7th, 2021, Alex Murdoch made a very startling 911 call, claiming that his wife Maggie and son had been shot and were laying near his dog kennels. He said that he had just gotten home and found them like this. Child was shot. 
Okay, okay. and sir, so give me the address again. It's 4147 Moselle Road. I've been up to it now. It's bad. Okay. Oh. Okay, and are they breathing? No, ma'am. Okay, and you said it's your wife and your son? My wife and my son. Are they in a vehicle? No, ma'am. They're on the ground out at my kennel. <laughs> okay, and did you see anyone? Okay, is he breathing at all? No, no. Is she? Okay, do you see anything? Do you see anyone in the area? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. What color is your house on the outside? What color is your house on the outside? Uh, it's white. You can't see it from the road. Okay, is it a house or a mobile home? It's a house. Okay, and what is your name? My name is Alec Murdoch. Okay, and did you hear anything, or did you come home and find them? No, man, I've been gone. I, I just came back. Okay, and was anyone else supposed to be at your house? No, ma'am. Please hurry. We're getting somebody out there to you. Oh. 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 Uh -huh. Okay, what is her name? Maggie, Maggie and Paul. Uh, Maggie uh, is her name? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And please hurry. Uh, uh, we're getting somebody out there to you. Me asking you these questions. Don't slow them down, okay? And you sure they're not breathing? Is he moving at all, your son? I know you said that she was shot, but what about your son? <laughs> Nobody. They're not. Neither one of them's moving. <laughs> what is your telephone number? <laughs> and does anything look out of place? Ma'am, I... I Not, not particularly, really, no, ma'am. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going back down there. Are they close, ma'am? Yeah, they're, they've been in route with you ever since uh, you've got on the phone with me. I have multiple people coming out there to you. Okay, can you do me a favor, Mr. Murdoch, and turn on the flashers on your car so that way they can see where the kennels are? Central Station 18, you will need Station 15. Do you have your flashers on for me, Mr. Murdoch? Yes. Okay. I don't want you to touch them at all, okay? I don't I don't know if you've already touched them, but I don't I don't want you to touch them just in case they can get any kind of evidence, okay? 
I I already touched them trying to get a um to see if they were breathing. Okay. Well, I, I just don't want you to move anything just in case they can get any oh, kind of right. evidence, yeah, okay? Oh. Ma'am, I'm going to call. I, I need to call some of my family. Okay. Well, you well, do me a favor for me. Whenever you see the officer or the medics, because they're, they're all coming to you. Absolutely. Okay. But we have them come in. Turn on the flashes on your vehicle so they can see you, okay? You got the flashers on for me? I do. Okay. All right. Just whenever you see them. Okay. How old is your son? 22. Okay. All right. We're, we're getting them out there to you, okay? And I will answer if you call. All right. Now, the first thing I found really interesting was that he was worried about calling his other family members. Wouldn't he be trying to revive his wife and his son? Or staying on the phone with dispatchers to try and figure out who did this? It's also hard to tell if he was seriously freaking out or if this was just all an act. So I would love your opinions on this 911 call. The 911 call happened at 10.07 p.m. Police were there 16 minutes later and secured the scene quickly before allowing EMS to come in the front gates of the property. At the property, shell casings were found on the ground and Maggie and Paul's lifeless bodies were next to the dog kennels. Officers tried to gather video surveillance from nearby residences, but they weren't able to get much. Three days later on June 10th, it was announced that Alex's dad, Richard, also died. He died at his home as a result of natural causes. So in the span of a week, three Murdochs were now dead. And not only that, but there were also still three deaths outside of this that were linked somehow to the Murdoch family. There was Stephen Smith, there was Gloria the housekeeper, and there was Mallory the friend on the boat. So this is the time period in which the House of Cards begins to start crumbling for Alex, and all of the lies and all of the tales that he told begin to unravel. The autopsies on Paul and Maggie were performed, and the results were released on June 15th, 2021. To no one's surprise, the coroner confirmed that both Paul and Maggie were victims of homicide and had died by multiple gunshot wounds. Maggie had been killed by an assault rifle, and Paul had been killed by a shotgun. The timeline also showed that they had been killed between 9 and 9.30 p.m. Now, obviously, one of them was shot first, and then the other was shot next. Throughout the first few weeks of the investigation, the Murdoch family begged the public to help them find who was responsible for the deaths of Maggie and Paul. A couple of days after the autopsy results came back, Alex's brothers did an interview with Good Morning America. They even went as far as to discuss the threats that Paul had gotten from that boat incident. He's a very caring person, and she was the rock of their family. This morning, members of the Murdoch family speaking for the first time since their brother Alec Murdoch found his 22-year-old son Paul and his wife Maggie shot to death outside their South Carolina home last week. Well, I got a call from, from Alec Monday night. And as soon as I had the phone, I knew something was wrong. Oh, man. He just told me. He said, come as fast as you can. Paul and Maggie have been hurt. His voice, the fear. He was just distraught. No arrests have been made, no suspects named. The Murdochs issuing a plea for help this morning. But the person that did this is out there and there's information, however big or however small it is. Did they have any enemies? I really don't know of any enemies. You hear all this talk on the, you know, social media with regard to Paul, but I don't know of anybody no. that would truly, that would truly be an enemy or truly want to harm them. Paul Murdoch had been awaiting trial, accused of being under the influence in 2019 while crashing a boat, killing 19-year-old passenger Mallory Beach. He had pleaded not guilty in the case. 
The Murdochs telling us Paul had been receiving threats from strangers, people they say they didn't know. Were they you know, violent threats? I didn't think it was a credible threat. If it was, I would have tried to do something or notified someone. Mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, maybe I made a mistake. The Murdochs are one of the most prominent families in South Carolina, part of the legal establishment going back almost a century. Three generations of Murdochs held a solicitor's job in this region for years. They also own a prominent law firm where Randy and Alec currently work today. Some in the community questioning if the family used their connections to protect Paul the night of the boat crash. Do you think anyone in your family interfered in any way? I don't. Do you feel like the, some of the perception of your family has been wrong? Yes. I see words like dynasty used and power. And I don't know exactly how people use those words, but we're just regular people. And we're hurting just like they would be hurting if this had happened to them. This morning, this tight-knit family holding on to each other. How's your brother doing? He's upright and looks strong and making his way and then and he just breaks down and just, I mean, it's tough for us. It changes you as a family. And I can't imagine the horror that my brother's experiencing. However, pretty early on, law enforcement made a point to say that there was no public threat. And typically when they say that there is no public threat after a murder, and knowing that there has not been nobody arrested for the murder, it's because the murderer is usually somebody close to the victims, therefore not a threat to the public because it is a personal crime. As all of this was happening, about a week later on June 23rd, 2021, during the investigation for the Murdoch murders, Stephen Smith, that death from 2015, that murder investigation was reopened. And reopening it makes total sense, and it should have never been closed if there was no hit-and-run evidence like I stated earlier. But also reopening it seemed even more personal. Were these two families connected somehow? Clearly investigators knew more than they were letting on. Two weeks after that, on July 7th, Connor Cook, who was on the boat during that boating accident, filed a lawsuit against Alex with the help of attorneys, claiming that Alex tried to frame him as the driver of the boat. So see what I meant by that house of cards falling? It was like some new detail or revelation was happening every couple of days. And this went on for months. So follow along here, guys, because we are going to just be unloading bombshell after bombshell after bombshell here. So about a month later after that, on August 6, 2021, all of Paul's charges were formally dropped due to his death, leaving Mallory's family heartbroken and worried about ever receiving justice. On August 11th, 14th Circuit Solicitor Duffy Stone sent a letter to South Carolina Attorney General Alan Wilson, stating he intended to recuse himself from the investigations into the deaths of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. In that letter, he said, Citing the events of today in the investigation of the homicides of Paul and Maggie Murdoch, I am asking that you assume all prosecutor functions in this matter immediately. The issue was also cited as a conflict of interest. You see, Alex volunteered part-time as a prosecutor in Duffy Stone's office, and now with him recusing himself, this was the first indication to the public that Alex was likely being seriously looked into for Maggie and Paul's murders. After that, many people were absolutely confident that Alex had something to do with that murder. And to law enforcement behind the scenes, he was definitely a person of interest. Almost three months after the murder of his wife and son, on September 2nd, Alex's career officially became a career on the rocks. A suspicious check under that DBA Forge account that I had mentioned was found on his desk. So his firm began an internal investigation and found that he had been stealing money from clients and the firm for personal use. The very next day, Alex was confronted with the findings and admitted that he had in fact been embezzling money. He resigned that very afternoon. One day after resigning, on September 4th, as if he hadn't done enough damage to the people around him and his older son Buster had him been traumatized enough by the unsolved murders of his mom and brother, Alex decided to take it one step further 
and he created an assisted plan to end his own life. He was shot in the head and called 911 himself. Captain County 911, what is your emergency? Oh, no, I'm Salkahatchee Road. Okay, what's the address on Salkahatchee Road? I'm by the church. Uh, what church? Here? The... What church are you talking about? Uh, I don't know the name of it with the red roof. Okay, what end of Salkahatchee Road? Because I don't know what you're talking about. Um, at the Hampton County side. Okay, what's going on? I stopped, I got a flat tire, mm -hmm. and I stopped, and somebody stopped to help me, and when I turned my back, they tried to shoot me. Oh, okay, were you shot? Yes, but okay. I mean, I'm okay. You shot where? Where were you shot at? Huh? Did they actually shoot you, or they tried to shoot you? They shot me, but... Uh Okay, wait, you need EMS? Uh, well, I mean, yes, I, I can't drive. Okay. I'm and I'm bleeding a lot. Where, where part of your body? Uh, I'm not sure, somewhere on my head. Your head? Somewhere on my head. Somebody just stopped for me, ma'am, um, for 911. Okay, still? Hey. Okay, let me speak to him, see if he can tell me exactly where you are. Okay. Red roof. Yeah, hurry, please. Okay, and what's your name? I'm still here. I'm gonna stay on the line with you. What's your name? Alex Murdoch. Alex Murdoch. Yes, ma'am. And you see you were driving, you got a flat tire, somebody stopped to help you, and they shot you? Well, they pulled over, yes, ma'am, like they were going to help me. Okay, stay on the line with me. We're going to get some. I'm bleeding pretty bad. Okay. St. John's Missionary Church. St. John's Missionary Church? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And can you give me a description of the person that shot you or shot at you? Yes, ma'am. I mean, okay. it was a, okay. right. a, well, a white fella. Uh, I'd say a white male, uh -huh. a fair amount younger than me, uh, really, okay. really short hair. Um, you have an ambulance coming, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stay on the line. I got them on the way. You think one of y'all can drive me to the hospital? Uh, yes, sir. You want to get the trunk, though, because I got a baby and needs to get on the back. You think one of y'all can get in this car and drive me? Uh, yes, sir. They're going to drive me to the hospital. Ma'am? Ma'am? I'm still here, so they, they're on the way. Don't hang, don't hang up. There are two other 911 calls, one by Alex, but they're mostly all the same information. He had a fractured skull and was hospitalized, but it wasn't super critical. A couple of days later, Alex released a statement saying, The murders of my wife and son have caused an incredibly difficult time in my life. I have made a lot of decisions that I truly regret. I'm resigning from my law firm and entering rehab after a long battle that has been exacerbated by these murders. I am immensely sorry to everyone I've hurt, including my family, friends, and colleagues. I ask for prayers as I rehabilitate myself and my relationships. It was then that people were made aware that Alex was claiming that he suffered from an oxy addiction. And this shocked many people because on the outside, he didn't fit the looks of an addict and he was a very well-known and respected attorney. But in a twist that Alex probably did not see coming, as he was releasing this statement, the firm released a statement of their own, saying, This is disappointing news for all of us. 
Rest assured that our firm will deal with this in a straightforward manner. There is no place in our firm for such behavior. The firm immediately issued reimbursement checks to all the client trusts as needed. Alex's license to practice law was then suspended, effective immediately by the South Carolina Supreme Court. But the House of Cards wasn't done following, and the blows just kept coming. On September 14th, Curtis Smith was arrested for his involvement with Alex Murdoch's shooting. His charges included assisting in an attempt to end one's life, assault and battery of a high aggravated nature, pointing and presenting a firearm, distribution of drugs, possession of drugs, insurance fraud, and conspiracy to commit insurance fraud. A pretty hefty amount of charges. But the question on everybody's mind still was why would Alex want to end his life? Was it because he was now caught in all of this bad behavior and disgraced in the community that once respected him? Did he see no other alternative and just did not want to face the consequences for things that he had done? Or was it done as one more strategic chess move of Alex's to selfishly benefit and reap rewards somehow? Well, as it turns out, Alex admitted to asking Curtis to shoot him in order to get his son Buster a $10 million life insurance payout. So it wasn't because he was ashamed or heartbroken over his regrets or the murders of his wife and son. It was once again, big surprise, a decision driven by greed. Alex also began saying that Curtis not only shot him, but was one of his oxy dealers. And we're going to come back to this because that ties into the story once more. The next day was when all things circled back to Gloria Satterfield. On September 15th, Gloria's sons filed a wrongful death suit against Alex Murdoch. That same day, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED, announced that they were opening a criminal investigation into Gloria's death and also the handling of her estate. Alex Murdoch turned himself into authorities fresh out of rehab on September 16th for the insurance fraud charges. He was given a $20,000 bond despite prosecutors seeking a $100,000 bond. He then headed straight back to rehab. Gloria's family wasn't happy about his release, even though those charges had nothing to do with her case. They filed something stating that they wanted him arrested and in custody until they were paid back what they were owed. While all of these details were unfolding, Curtis Smith did an interview for his part in Alex's attempted, assisted, ending his own life situation. You feel betrayed. I consider him one of my best friends. He's like a brother to me. That so-called brother is Alec Murdoch. South Carolina authorities say he asked Curtis Smith to shoot and kill him September 4th. The plan, according to SLED, to help Murdoch's surviving son Buster collect a $10 million life insurance policy. <laughs> but it didn't work. Instead, Murdoch told SLED what happened, so they arrested both of them. But where's the connection between the two? Through court records, we found out Murdoch represented Smith in a personal injury lawsuit back in 2010. Had to have three discs removed at the back and got rods and screws in every place of them. It's not fun. Smith says injuries from a logging accident left him permanently disabled. Talk to me about the pain. Uh, it's, it's an everyday thing. I mean, it's every day. I know it's there all day long. Court documents indicate Smith took OxyContin for that pain, but fast forward to this month. Authorities charge Smith with distribution of meth and possession of marijuana, a drug parallel to what unfolded during Murdoch's bond hearing. If anyone uh, wants to see the face of what opioid addiction does, you're looking at it. In the days after the shooting, Murdoch said he checked himself into rehab for substance abuse. Is Alex somebody that you cared about? Yeah, I say he's like a brother to me. I'd have done anything in the world for him, almost anyway. It just, it's, it's crushing to know that, that evidently I mean nothing to nobody, especially him. Curtis says he feels betrayed. Do you see the truth out there? Do you, do you see the truth coming forward in this case? I hope that when it's all said and done, that everybody will wind up being exactly what it's supposed to be. 
Basically, he turned it into a sob story about himself. What a way to just take accountability. I'm telling you, these men, it is just like beyond. Finally, a settlement for Gloria Satterfield's wrongful death suit was reached on October 4th, 2021. But that would not be the end for Alex. Not even close. Just two days later, he was named the defendant in another lawsuit, this time filed by the firm that he had once been a partner at. Alex's attorney said, This is a very sad development. Alex holds every member of the Peters, Murdoch, Parker, Eltsroth, Diedrich law firm in very high esteem. He has pledged his full cooperation to the firm. And honestly, the only thing sad was that someone as corrupt and as evil as Alex is was walking around freely in a position of being able to hurt even more people. Corey Fleming, the first attorney who had represented Gloria's sons, was suspended from practicing with his law license on October 8th. And on October 14th, Gloria's family would finally see some justice and accountability start to happen. Alex was arrested in Florida and charged with two counts of obtaining property by false pretenses in connection with Gloria Satterfield's wrongful death settlement. He was ordered to stay in custody pending a psychiatric exam. His assets were also frozen pending the wrongful death cases. Finally, he was starting to be held accountable, but not before he was trying to sell some things, sling some things from jail. Alvin S. Glenn Detention Center. On October 21st, 2021, Alec Murdoch called his brother, John Marvin Murdoch, and his son, Buster. They were on a trip to Nevada, now made notorious by this photo of John Marvin and Buster at a Las Vegas casino table. It ended up as an exhibit in court against Alec Murdoch. Alec called his family to warn them. In court the other day, they made a big deal about things. They're going to be moving to try to prevent us from selling stuff. Right. We need to, to get as much as we can completed. On the call, John Marvin suggests selling some of the farm equipment to pay off some of Alex's debts, but says it must be done on the up and up. You might speak to Jim if you get a chance, just to yep. find out what kind of time frame he thinks before they get any kind of order preventing us from doing anything. Okay. And I mean, well, I'm just, know, I'm just doing, doing everything by the book, and um, yeah, and it's and going to pay. It ain't like we're squirreling it away. It's going to pay bank stuff. Well, it goes to the unsecured note, so, so everything else has something secure in it. So it makes sense that unsecured items would go to an unsecured note. Two days later, the wheels are already in motion to freeze Alex's assets by the state, money to pay back Alex's alleged fraud victims. Alec calls his son Buster. It's October 23rd. Buster is still in Nevada with John Marvin. New developments with the motions and everything, trying to get us to quit selling stuff. I don't know really what that's going to ha- what have in store. Yeah, I told y'all that was coming. Yeah, man, this this Eric. This no, Eric, did you know I said that was coming? No, I just saw it on Twitter. No, I called Jim Marvin the other day to tell, to tell him he needed to do it as quickly as possible because they were going to be doing it any day, making a yeah. motion. So this Eric, this Eric Bland guy seems like a real, a real charm. Well, you know, this is his five minutes in the sun, you know? Gloria Satterfield's family broke their silence a couple of weeks later. She worked hard at what she did. And she loved what she did. She took honor in the job that she did. Gloria Satterfield was the Murdoch family's longtime housekeeper. Her sister Ginger told me the families were close. We thought of them as an extended family also because Gloria did. In February 2018, Gloria stopped by the Murdoch home and there was an accident. What were you told about what had happened? Just that she had fell that she was tripped by the dogs and that they thought she had a head injury because they saw blood. And that was about it until we got to the hospital. Gloria languished in ICU for 21 days. Ginger will always remember the last one. I just said, Gloria, I'll be back tomorrow. And I love you. And she told me, Love you, too. That's the last word I heard her say. At her funeral two days later, Gloria's son, Tony, says Alec Murdoch pulled him aside and said he would make sure Tony and his brother got an insurance settlement for the accident. 
Did you believe him? Yeah, of course. Why well, wouldn't I? He said, I want to make sure the boys are taken care of because he loved Gloria that much. But three years went by and nothing seemed to be happening. No money came their way. And I says, you know, something's fishy about this thing. And I said, I just don't think these boys are going to get what they deserve was, you know, due to them. Then came the shocking news of the murders in the Murdoch family. Buried in the slew of news articles was a mention of the housekeeper's death and the half a million dollar settlement that had gone to her children. That was news to the family. How much money did the family get after Gloria died? Zero. Not a dime. Not a dime. They hired lawyers to investigate and discovered something startling. The actual insurance settlement for Gloria Satterfield's death totaled $4.3 million. Where did all the money go? We're still tracing where the money actually landed, but it is impossible to burn that kind of money in Hampton, South Carolina. In November 2021, Alex was indicted for filing a false police report, conspiracy, and false claim for payment in connection with his assisted unaliving plot. He was also denied bond, which was the best thing that could have happened that day. So now you're probably thinking, is the house of cards for Alex finally fully collapsed? Nope, not even close. We are still not done. On November 19th, Alex was indicted on 30 new charges in regards to the Gloria Satterfield lawsuit, then 21 new charges a couple of weeks later. But this time, he was given a $7 million bond. Come January 2022, as if Alex didn't have enough charges against him, he was indicted on 23 more charges, including computer crimes and breach of trust. And this was right after his lawyers had asked for a lower bond, which was luckily denied. More lawsuits were also about to come Alex's way. Paul's former girlfriend Morgan, who was on that boat, filed her own lawsuit against Parker's Convenience, Buster Murdoch, and Alex Murdoch, and Paul and Maggie's estates in February of this year. Then on March 16th, Corey Fleming was indicted on 18 counts involving the theft of the Satterfield's money from Gloria's wrongful death suit. And 30 more charges came for him, Alex, and the CEO of their bank, Russell Lafitte. And I don't think I'm saying that right, but well, let's go with it. Those charges included breach of trust, conspiracy, and computer crime. Corey was given a $100,000 bond, but is still in jail as of now. So where all that money went, who knows, because apparently he doesn't even have the 10% to bail himself out, which is 10 grand. So apparently Russell and Alex schemed together for years, many years ago, and stole money from clients, and it's all coming out now. On May 31st, 2022, Alex signed a confession of judgment, which awarded the Satterfield family more than $4.3 million dollars. And on June 3rd, it was announced that plans are being made to exhume her body as she was not given an autopsy after her death, and they want to look into that. Maybe it wasn't just a trip over the dog slip and fall down the stairs after all. In the beginning of June of this year, Alex and Curtis were both charged with even more counts, including criminal conspiracy and money laundering. Alex was given charges also related to conspiracy with Oxy. Part of the statement read, the state grand jury alleges a criminal conspiracy regarding approximately 437 checks totaling to approximately $2.4 million that went from Alex Murdoch to Curtis Smith from October 17, 2013 through February 28, 2021. Gloria's family is now suing Curtis because they claim that $2 million of the money that was supposed to go to them went to Curtis in all of these drug schemes. It seems that Alex was involved in these drug schemes as well, given that he gave at least $2.4 million to Curtis. So was he embezzling money to fund a drug habit? Alex was officially disbarred last month on July 12th, and two days later, he was also officially charged with the murders of Maggie and Paul, his wife and son. He pleaded not guilty on July 20th, and his attorneys requested a trial as soon as possible. While he's been in jail, he's still been ordering family around, including having them take flowers to the grave. Did Buster tell you about putting flowers out? Yes. So Lauren actually did that um, on Monday. Um, but if you want me to put some more out, I can. 
she put some um, greenery and berries that she had ordered from somewhere, she said, and maybe even a leaf, I think, is what her text said. Um, but I can put some more out if you think if you think she'd like more. Would she put it for Maggie and Paul or for Daddy? Uh, for all three, plus with Daddy. So she, okay, so she, well, I mean, she took care of it. I just want to make sure. I just sat down to write you a letter. I'm out of the um, cemetery. I brought bought some um, poinsettias, and um, do you know what a Christmas calalinchi is? Yeah. Did you tell Grandma got, that we were putting flowers out there? Yes, I did. I talked to her yesterday for a while and told her. Did Lizzie put flowers out for Mom? Um, uh, actually, she said she was going tomorrow, so she's going tomorrow. I know she promised me she would. Yeah, no, she she said that because I told her that I went over there. I went over there Saturday because I had to go through Hampton. Um, and then she said that you had asked her that, and then she said she was going Monday to do it. So she's gone. She hasn't gone yet. Is everything okay? With? You went to the cemetery? Yeah. Everything was okay? Yeah, everything's fine. You okay? Yeah. All right. You got to get those markers and stuff. Yeah, I think I think somebody's working on it. I'm not really, I'm not really sure who... I think Lynn's working on getting one for Daddy and then getting some ones for me to pick out to give to Marion to approve. Send for So. All right, I'll call you tomorrow, okay? I love you. All right, love you too. Bye. Other jail calls included one to Buster about potentially being readmitted into law school after he was kicked out in December of 2019 for suspected plagiarism. Alex paid another attorney, Butch Bowers, 60 grand to secure Buster's readmittance back into the University of South Carolina. Did you talk back to Butch? Um, I spoke to Butch a couple times on Friday, and he was supposed to be getting in touch with Hubbard. He had gotten in touch with Hubbard, and Hubbard seems to, you know, he just had, apparently Hubbard had to run it by, like, admissions and, and all this other stuff, to, I guess, to be able to, to set the record clean or whatever, but I haven't, Butch, Butch is probably going to call me this week, I would assume. So did Butch think that they were going to do that, that Hubbard was Hubbard and sounded willing to do that? Uh, yeah, Butch seems so. Butch said that he was, you know, he he, he says it, that he's cautiously optimistic. About taking but, the restrictions uh, off of you and making a 2.55. Yeah, correct. Just Now, if they do that... Happy. It, it, Go ahead. It, it seems to me like they have to because they can't they can't offer me to come back in the fall and then I do everything in the fall and they're like, Well, I know what you did, but this is still your grade. Yeah, you and say you go make a three two and they say, Well, you still got this. I I, I does not make yeah. sense either. Now if they offer you that buster to start fresh, do you think that's the thing to do? I do. I do think that's the thing to do. I definitely think it's the thing to do. Um, you know, no question. Given the scenario, you know, me not knowing if I'm going to go back and work for the law firm, you know, I need my grades need to be as high as possible so that I, if I want a different job, I can get one. No doubt. And that'll allow um, you to do that. I, I, I don't make up your mind until you know all the details, but I think that's a good thing. Well, I'll be glad for you to hear back from Bush. That's kind of exciting news, Buster. I've been worried to death about that. Apparently to the Murdochs, money just solves everything, and maybe we should just like dub them as like the money Murdochs. I don't know. Now most recently this week, there was a denial of a gag order. Alex's attorneys filed for a gag order that would prohibit any lawyers on both sides of the case from making any comments to the media not made in court. 
His lawyers also had asked to keep most motions in the case sealed and therefore secret to the public. The judge denied the motion, saying that the public is entitled to know how justice is being administered. There will be no official gag order in Alec Murdoch's murder trial. That is the decision of a South Carolina judge that was made today. According to the state newspaper, Judge Clifton Newman has denied a request for all records in the case to be sealed, meaning any witnesses or people involved in the case will be allowed to discuss the case outside of court as well. Both Murdoch's lawyers and the South Carolina Attorney General's Office prosecutors asked for a full gag order because of the attention on the case, so it could be tried in the courtroom and not in the media. Judge Noonan says that his ruling that the existing rules of the court should be enough. Murdoch was indicted on malice murder charges last month for allegedly killing his wife and son back in June of 2021. The theories of this case are continuing to circle, and there are many possibilities. What would his motive be to kill his wife and son? I mean, the first theory that comes to mind, and also one of the most common theories, is Maggie, of course, looking into divorce. If Maggie divorced him, it's likely that she would no longer be able to protect any of his secrets. By being married to him, she would have known way too much. Also, she would be entitled to quite a bit of money, and he was embezzling, and then maybe his financial documents would have to be gone through with a fine-tooth comb so he would get caught. So but maybe that's why he wanted to murder her, to make sure that people didn't look into his finances. Another theory is life insurance money. Now, Alex claims that Maggie and Paul didn't have life insurance, but I find it hard to believe given that he had a $10 million policy on himself. Also, it seems that everything that comes out of his mouth in regards to finance and money is just a lie, so I don't necessarily believe him at all. Could he have been trying to collect more money? And is that what this whole thing is the root of? It's just money and greed. Or could he have just been going after Maggie for whatever reasons, like I had stated earlier, and Paul just happened to be there, so he had no choice but to shoot him too because he witnessed it. It's been said that Paul had a friend whose dog was actually staying in their kennels at that time, so maybe Paul went there to check on the friend's dog. Or could Paul's death be linked to his three felony charges? Was there going to be a huge payout that was that Paul was going to have to face for all of those charges? And was Alex going to have to foot the bill? And once again, was he struggling financially? Also, if Maggie was staying at the beach home, it makes me wonder why she went to the other home. Maggie loved her dog so much, so maybe she was going to visit them? I'm not sure. We also know that Alex's dad was very sick, so maybe she was lured there to visit his dying dad. There are just so many theories and questions unanswered with their deaths. It is so evident that this family is powerful and still gets away with quite a few things here and there. But hopefully with all of the charges Alex has, which now has a total of over 79 charges, Hopefully he'll be locked up and this family can like take a step back and realize how awful the things they have done truly are and how they have gotten away with so much just because of their last name. Alex's family continues to support him and says that they will wait until evidence disproves his claim of innocence. I would love to hear your thoughts and theories on this case in the comments below because I'm curious as to what you think his motive was with killing his wife do you think that he intentionally killed his son or was it to because he was a witness to the crime? What are your thoughts? And of course, I will keep you updated as new information becomes available. And I'm sure there will be lots more information given how crazy this case is. I'm sure a lot more is going to come to light. And we know that Alex's attorney is requesting a quick trial. So it's going to be interesting to see when this goes to trial. Maybe I can stream it here and we can watch it together. I don't know. It's going to be a fascinating one. It is definitely going to be a fascinating one. So I will keep you guys posted. Make sure that you subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already so that you not only get notified of updates in this case, but you also get notified when I post other case videos on my channel. And please don't forget on your way out to show your support for the channel by giving this video a thumbs up, hit that like button. It totally helps the channel and supports the channel. It's a free way to just say, hey, Annie, I like you. I like your content. I'm going to support you. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to keep you updated. Don't forget, leave your comments below. I want to know what you think. I want to hear your theories. I want to know what you think the truth is with this money Murdoch slime ball. All right, guys, until the next case, stay safe. Bye.